Thanks very much. I think we actually will try to do a magic round in the hack day at some point. Andrew, if we can get that set up, that would be awesome. Cool. Uh, OK, so I'm here to talk about GoKit. I think in the pamphlet it says it's a standard library for distributed programming. Maybe that's what it is. Uh, we'll find out. Uh, but before I get into what GoKit is, I need to provide a little context, a little story. So let me tell you the story. Uh, late last year, Andrew um, came to me and asked me to give a talk at Fosdame and the London Go gathering, which is like a meetup there, uh, pretty much about whatever I thought was important at the Go universe at the time. So at the time, I was working at SoundCloud, and we had a lot of large and really quite successful uh, projects running in Go. But I found it wasn't really being chosen for new services, for new work. Um, in fact, for business logic code, it turned out over time it was becoming more and more absent. And it was getting edged out by languages like Scala and Ruby. And that made me sad, right? Because I believe Go is almost the perfect language for this kind of stuff. At SoundCloud, we have a microservice architecture. And Go is in many ways the perfect language for microservices, in my opinion. So I wanted to see it succeed here. And then I think that if Go is going to reach the next level of its success, if it's going to succeed in this way, it needs to have a good story for companies like SoundCloud, companies that are what I'm calling the modern enterprise. So in my view, the modern enterprise is a company that is tech-oriented, consumer-focused, successful, um, which means that it has exponential growth that it needs to keep up with. Uh, it's sizable, it's probably at least 50 engineers, up to maybe 1,000. And due to prevailing market trends, it probably has what's called a microservice or a service-oriented architecture. It doesn't have to hit all these boxes, but probably most of them. And here are some maybe examples of what I consider to be modern enterprises. Google, they might be too big. Amazon, similarly, they kind of do their own thing. Uh, but you get down to companies like Twitter, like Netflix, Spotify, SoundCloud, many more. Um, this is kind of what I'm talking about. Etsy would also qualify, but they run a monolith. So organizations like these are important, in my view, because they're kind of like the primordial soup of the technology sector. They're financially incentivized by the way that their uh, venture capital works these days to take bets and risks on software. And it, if it means faster time to market, a leaner infrastructure, um, any sort of game-changing new feature that these bets can kind of win them, they're going to do it, right? And like it or not, they're kind of driving the technological conversation as a result. They're making these bets. Some of them are winning. They're talking about them. And other companies are following in their footsteps. So we look at things like the rise of the idea of DevOps or containerization or immutable infrastructure, microservices. These are all risks that have gained prominence through these sorts of companies that we now kind of take for granted, in my opinion. So critically, these aren't just technical success stories, right? They're business success stories. They're the things that companies can, that engineers can bring to their managers and say, if we do this, it's not just a win for me, it's a win for all of us. You can sell the idea of DevOps to your director of engineering because it gives them real perceivable business advantages. So if Go is going to continue to grow, I think it needs to have representation in companies like this, in spaces like this. <clears throat> I think that we need to be able to tell not only technical success stories, but business success stories. So I believe it has good chances. It's already the language of the server. And we know it's great for large organizations. So what's missing? Why was Go not a success story at SoundCloud? What's missing in these companies? Go is represented here, but it's not really talked about. It's not the language of, of the business there. What's missing? So of course, one major thing that's missing is simply maturity. We're five years old, which feels like a long time to people like me who have been in the community from the beginning. But in the grand scheme of things, I guess it's really not that long. Uh, but we're getting there, right? So ThoughtWorks puts out this technology radar. Go has been in the adopt column for quite a long time. So we're going to get there, and it's going to take literally some time. But another thing is library support. A lack of higher order library support for like the business domain of microservices definitely held Go back at SoundCloud. In my opinion, modern enterprises need a set of code, tools, idioms, and best practices 
on which to build their business. So this is what I said to Andrew. Um, we don't have a strong story here, and it makes it hard. So what I'd like to do is to propose a project to bring these sorts of things to businesses, to make business success stories possible, and to make Go sort of a player in this ecosystem. And so enter GoKit, right? GoKit is a set of higher order abstractions for microservices, fundamentally. Like Go, it has strong idioms and opinions, but it's not too opinionated in the sense that we don't need you to reinvent your architecture to use it. OK. So if you've played in the space before, you might be familiar with projects like uh, Finagle from Twitter. GoKit's very similar to that in design. Uh, Netflix has a project called Ribbon, which is part of a constellation of services. Uh, it's also very similar to that as well. So let's define our boundaries by setting some goals. What should GoKit do? First of all, GoKit should make Go a first-class citizen at the application layer. So in your typical architecture, you have at the top the internet-facing stuff. That's where you're running HAProxy or Nginx. At the bottom, you have your data layer, databases, data services. But in the middle, where you pay, uh, what you pay your programmers to do is your application layer, your business logic. And that's where I think GoKit is, should be targeting. Another goal is that we want to target the microservice or a service-oriented architecture. We're focused on things important to that kind of architecture. And that's because our target market has overwhelmingly chosen to adopt that architecture. We're going to treat RPC as the primary messaging pattern. That's just to start. We're not fundamentally opposed to other patterns. We just want to use it as sort of a, a rallying point to cover 80% of the cases so that we can get to a useful state very quickly. We want to operate in a mixed environment in the sense that we don't expect to have complete buy-in at your organization. We want to make it easy to step into GoKit and take pieces on a piecemeal basis. GoKit services must play nice with existing services. We don't expect you to blow away all of your existing code and, and, and work. We also want to support pluggable transports in the sense that your business logic should be decoupled from the way you access it. One service should theoretically be available over many transports, perhaps even in the same process. And again, this is keeping in the same idea of we don't want you to blow away your infrastructure. We want to be able to say, if you're using Thrift, GoKit services can work with Thrift. If you're using HTTP JSON, they can work there too. We also want to strongly encourage best practices. Our contributors so far, and hopefully in the future, have experience in large-scale infrastructures. We've made these mistakes so that you don't have to repeat in your organization. And this can be a big selling point, especially to organizations that are a bit smaller or perhaps on the fence about using Go. It's a good selling point to engineering directors and, and managers and that sort of thing. OK, so just as important as goals, in my opinion, are non-goals. We sort of put a border at the things we're not interested in doing. Let's talk about a few non-goals. One non-goal is that we're not going to require any specific infrastructure or have any infrastructure dependencies. That means we're not going to rely on a particular lock store. We're not going to need you to be running etcd somewhere. We're going to work in any scale environment and grow with your organization. So GoKit services are going to work if you're copying SCPing binaries to DigitalOcean droplets, or if you're scheduling services on a 10,000 node Mesos cluster. Equally good. Another non-goal is that we're not going to have opinions about orchestration. GoKit services can be deployed, run, and supervised however your organization sees fit to do it. So that means if you're deploying DEBs and RPMs directly, fine. If you're using Chef or Puppet or Ansible or Salt, fine. If you're using a container engine, Docker, Rocket, doesn't matter. If you're using a container OS, Core OS, Rancher OS, Atomic. If you're running your own platform as a service, it's all fine. We don't care. Another non-goal is that we don't have opinions about configuration. We don't mandate a specific mechanism of build or runtime configuration, whether it's environment variables, flags, configuration files, all OK. And the theme to these non-goals, I think, is that we want to eliminate barriers to adoption. We want to make it as easy as possible to say, GoKit is something you can try, see how it works. And I think if, we able, if we're able to get people hooked, then they're going to get hooked on Go. OK, so that's the boundaries of the project. Now let's talk about the pieces. And I'll run through these kind of quickly. Don't get too caught up on the details. I just want to give you an overview. Before I start, we need to talk about what is a service, actually. What is a service? Is it a blue box? No. Um, it's a thing, right? It's a thing that exists. Things talk to it. It talks to other things. 
And it turns out if you're building a distributed system like this, uh, you need certain stuff that you might even not be aware of. So some of those things are like, for example, rate limiting on ingress and egress. You might need circuit breaking when you're talking to uh, downstream services. So if they start failing, you don't bring down your infrastructure. You need things like service discovery and load balancing to find out where those things live and then control your access to them. And then even within the service, you need things like logging and metrics to make sure you know what's going on. And then for the system as a whole, you need, uh, it turns out, you need a system uh, of request tracing like Google's Dapper or Twitter's Zipkin. So you can see what's happening when a request hits the top of your infrastructure, goes all the way down through all of your stuff, and then comes back out. These things are important. So this is sort of the domain of what we're working in. And then if you open up the cover of this blue square, you see within the service, there's actually a sort of an onion, layers of things you need to consider. At the core is your business logic, of course, what they're paying you to do, but that's not nearly enough. You need to wrap that with stuff like metrics and in instrumentation so you can see what's going on and not, you're not guessing. Wrapping even that, you need things like analytics so you can know what's my daily active user rate, and you need to be able to compute that ac uh, accurately. And that information needs to come from a very low level. Then at a higher level, we talk about the service level. We talk about connectivity between services. Simply establishing the connections is one area of concern. And then making sure you do so safely. When they fail, you need to reconnect, so forth. And then you need metrics of all of that stuff so that your operations team can know what's going on. This is all very important. And then at the top level, you need transports to make things even speakable, communicable with other things in your infrastructure. So I want to draw this kind of like dividing line some things you care about very deeply, that's your domain. Other things that kind of generalize a bit, that's GoKit's domain, and that's what we're gonna give to you if you choose to go with us. Okay, so we're talking about RPCs, right? And sort of the core concept of the RPC is what I call an endpoint. And so we start with that. That's sort of the atom of GoKit, is this idea of an endpoint. It's a fundamental building block of clients and servers. It represents a single RPC method and it's generalized. So it's a function that takes a request and returns a response. Because we need to pass information across these layers of the onion, we use this context package, which is quite good. If you haven't seen it, I encourage you to take a look at it. I won't get into it in too much detail in this talk. But that's threaded through every endpoint. If you have endpoints, you can define middlewares. Middleware is something that, concretely, it's a function that takes an endpoint and returns an endpoint, but it allows you to compose behavior modifiers, chainable, uh, value and add kind of uh, behavior modifiers that let you implement all the things we saw in that diagram. I learned recently this is also called the decorator pattern. Maybe that's uh, uh, more familiar to you. So you're going to define a service and you're going to implement it as a collection of endpoints. Once you have an endpoint, you need to make it exposable to the world. So most bindings can be made directly from your service to the relevant transport library. We define a binding as something which wraps an endpoint and then implements whatever, uh, whatever your, your transport mechanism needs. Now let's go down into the service a little bit. Package log is one of the packages that GoKit is going to provide you. Um, we've had a hard one lesson here from a lot of experience. Package, logging takes, package log takes the strong opinion that structured logging is mandatory. So that means that uh, if you're used to logging just a, a string printf thing, GoKit says that's not a good idea. But it turns out if you pay that cost, you get a benefit. Not only are your logs much more easily machine parsable, the log package is equally useful both for application logging and log structured data pipelines like Storm or Kafka. We're still iterating on the best API here. A big thanks to Chris Hines, who I think is here somewhere. Um, ah, thanks very much. Yeah, he's uh, been helping us a lot with that. Similarly, package metrics still within the service. Um, this is sort of the boiled down distilled version of stuff we've learned at SoundCloud and elsewhere. We provide three interfaces that you can use to instrument your code. And then each of the interfaces supports a variety of backends of implementations that go to whatever metric service or instrumentation service you happen to have in your infrastructure. Big thanks to Prometheus team and to Coda Hale for helping uh, us nail this down. Okay. So now we get into the, some of the value add stuff, which is interesting. Rate limit is, as it should be obvious, it's a rate limiter you can stick on the server or client. Uh, it's implemented as a middleware. So you pass it the parameters, and then it returns a middleware that wraps something else. So big thanks to Roger Pepe, did I say that right, I hope, and Tomas Sanat, who uh, contributed quite a great deal to this. 
We also have something called a circuit breaker. If you're not familiar, it's something that sits uh, on a client and says, if you start noticing that all of your uh, requests are failing, open the circuit, break the circuit, and say, uh, we're not going to send any more requests to that downstream until it starts behaving better. It turns out if you have a large infrastructure, these things are critical. So we provide several implementations of circuit breakers, and you can wire them into your service. Similarly, load balancer, it's sort of a collection of things, and it's where we do our service discovery. So we have this concept of a publisher, which emits a, a constantly up-to-date stream of endpoints of the same thing, the instances of the same service. You wrap that with a load balancer, which has different strategies, round robin, random, uh, weighted, uh, health checked, this sort of thing. And then you wrap that in something which returns endpoints that you can use without knowing all the details. Right now we have implementations for DNS SRV, uh, console and etcd support is planned, others as we need them. Tracing is the implementation of the request tracing uh, system. So right now we have Zipkin. We're planning to support AppDash. And if anybody else uses anything else, we're happy to add support there. The idea is you annotate all of your incoming and outgoing requests with information about timing and this sort of thing. And then you can build sort of a, a tree of a, a call graph, so to speak. OK, so these are like some of the components. Let's wire them together into an example service. You can kind of see how this all works. And to motivate an example service, let's consider something called an add service, a one method service that has a, <clears throat> a single method add takes two integers and returns an integer. It turns out that can be simplified to just a function type, an add func that is a function that takes two integers and returns an integer. We'll do that for the example. And a simple Im implementation would be a pure add, which just returns a plus b. Straightforward enough. OK. Because we're doing this uh, using generalized RPC semantics, we need to define request and response types. So a request, is, a request type is just all the parameters, and the response is just the re, uh, return value. Easy enough. The signature of our add function is in our business domain. We care about integers in our business domain. But we need to somehow lift it to the endpoint domain so that we can start caring about network stuff. So let's write an adapter to lift our add function into an endpoint. And that's what this does. Uh, it would be a little bit more straightforward, except for this context thing. It turns out when you use a context, uh, you're part of a call graph that can be canceled at any, any one of your ancestors can cancel you. So you need to be sort of cognizant of that. And you need to, uh, that's what this highlighted line does. It says, if we're ever canceled, then abort our processing. Otherwise, carry on. And all this does is just invoke the add function using the uh, request and response interfaces. OK, straightforward. So we had our business domain. We lift it into the endpoint domain. And now we need to lift the endpoint into our transport domain. To do that, we use something that we call a binding. A binding is uh, something that wraps an endpoint and makes it callable over some transport. Let's pick gRPC just because the semantics are nice. A gRPC binding wraps an endpoint. It implements this add function. The add function does the same thing as the other lifter did. It just translates from one domain to another, basically. Um, bear in mind that gRPC requires a protobuf definition of our service. Here it is. Not a big deal. OK, so now if we have our add func, we can wrap it with an endpoint. Then we can wrap our endpoint with a binding. And then we can expose the binding according to the rules of our transport. And that's kind of what this is, step by step. And of course, this will be slightly different for every transport. I'm very sorry for ignoring that error. I know I should never do that in a public presentation. I, I Forgive me. So this is fine, but it seems like quite a lot of ceremony, right? Like, I could have done this a lot easier without all of these layers of abstraction. Why did I bother, right? Uh, it turns out that we're driving to a goal. And the goal is to enable us to build all this value-add stuff that we need in a way that composes nicely and, and looks nice and is extendable and all these lovely things. So let's think about one such concern. We've implemented our add function, but we don't know anything about it. We want to log all the requests to it, pre presumably. So we could do that by implementing an endpoint middleware, which is a function that takes an endpoint and returns an endpoint. But then we'd have to do like type assertions or something to get our parameters and return values out, and that's not great. So alternatively, we can define sort of a business middleware. And that's a, uh, the same pattern. It takes a add func and returns an add func. But now we have access to the parameters of the add func. And so we can do things with them. 
And so if we have this, then we can implement logging as a composable middleware or as a composable decorator. And if you're interested in the idea of decorators, Tomas will be doing a talk that uh, goes into some detail about it uh, tomorrow, I believe. So a decorator is something that takes some parameters and then returns a middleware. Middleware is something that takes a function and returns a function. And so that is an implementation of the add func. So we have this sort of three stack. But then once you're in there, you have access to all of these interesting bits, right? So we can defer a function that's going to log all of the parameters and how long the request took, and then invoke the, uh, the thing that we're wrapping and then return. And this is a really powerful pattern, as it turns out. It enables this thing called, that I call declarative composition. It allows us to compose business middlewares around the add func by using these well-understood chaining techniques. Here I kind of spell it out, but there's helper methods that do this a little bit nicer too. We can compose endpoint middlewares in the same way. These are things that deal with uh, endpoint domain concerns and can be composed together. And what happens is when you do this, you get a, a, a func main that's really easy to read and reason about. And this is what it looks like, minus a few things. This is really uh, the complete func main for our ad service. We define our, our ad function. We say it's going to be a pure ad function. That's our business logic. We wrap it with logging and instrumentation. Cool. Then we define an endpoint, which is the lifted ad func. We wrap it with our go kit domain endpoint middlewares. And then you expose it using the gRPC binding. It's pretty cool. And that's what we're driving to. If you remember back to the uh, box diagram where I had the onion layers, we have exactly the same thing here, right? Above the line is your domain. Below the line is the GoKit domain. Cool. Really quickly, a, a slide about clients. An endpoint is just something, a function, effectively, that takes a request and returns a response. You can serve that in the server. You can also call that as a client. So an endpoint can be used in both servers and clients, and that's nice because it means that we get all this value add uh, uh, middleware equally applicable to both servers and clients. We can use the same set of tools. So on the client side, you would maybe uh, make an endpoint that uh, is a function of a gRPC dial, and then you wrap it with a circuit breaker, rate limiter, whatever else you need to. Same set of tools. Nice. So is this a good idea, what I've just shown you? I, I don't know. Um, maybe not. <laughs> But it seems like a good place to start. And it's important, I think, that we have a story here. Even if this isn't the final form of it, I think we need to start talking about this and start showing some code. I don't know. Good place to start. OK. So what's next in GoKit world? Well, we have a pretty concrete to-do list. We have some near-term things, a lot of things that we know we need to implement or want to implement. There are issues filed for all this stuff. Longer term, I want to build tools to adapt to, uh, to generate these adapters and these bindings. It's a lot of boilerplate. I think it can be done. I'm not sure how yet. We want to expand our example coverage. That's, of course, very important. And as I mentioned earlier, we want to support messaging patterns beyond just simple RPC. But beyond a to-do list, I'm really interested, and I think what's most important is to get your use cases. GoKit is community-driven, like everything in the Go community, and it benefits from everyone's experience. If you've done this at your organization before, this type of thing, I want to hear from you to learn from your experience. And perhaps even more importantly, if you want to do something like this in your organization, if you want to bring Go into your company in the application domain for your business logic, and you need some help, you need GoKit to do something it doesn't currently do, it's not currently on the roadmap, I want to hear from you too. That's really important to me. And with these things, I hope that we can take Go to the next level. It's already becoming the language of the server. I think it can become the language of the modern enterprise. And I think that's what we need if we're going to see Go reach its next level of adoption in the community. And that's really all I have. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>